next speaker is uh, Sarah Luridan. I hope I'm not butchering your name. Uh, and she is uh, a science outreach officer at the Université de Libre de Bruxelles. And she's also a uh, chief editor in a uh, popular science blog. And uh, she also supervises outreach uh, projects um, at the VUB Ch Children's University. Um, and she will be talking to us about um, outreach, doing outreach at, at a university in general. Uh, I think I will just keep it short. So she, if you want to, if you want to add anything to what I've just said, Sarah, just just jump in. Um, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, hi to everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. First of all, I think it's a wonderful initiative that you're putting science communication on the agenda like this today. Um, so yeah, well done to the organizing team. Um, thank you for introducing me. And I promise in a minute, I will introduce myself properly, tell you what I'm doing here today. But I wanted to dive in immediately and start with uh, a, short video, a short video. So a visual example to start off my talk. Um, I'm gonna, for the first time, share my screen, also try to share the audio. So I hope it's gonna work. And if it doesn't, I can just, you know, put the, the link in the chat or something. So yeah, we'll see. Okay. We can see a black background. That's good. And, yeah, <laughs> That's a start your and then, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna start to play. Um, so if you don't hear audio immediately, just let me know in the chat and then I'll put a link there. Okay, let's start this thing off. There we go. Works. And now, a page from our Sunday morning almanac. September 28th, 1928, 86 years ago today. A day which changed medicine completely by accident. It happened in the laboratory of Alexander Fleming, a Scottish scientist who had returned from his summer vacation to discover a strange occurrence in a Petri dish. I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine, Fleming later said, but I guess that's exactly what I did. What he found in that Petri dish was a mold that had drifted through the air from another lab in which it stopped the spread of a bacteria culture Fleming had been growing, dead in its tracks. Though he didn't have the resources to advance his discovery, other researchers did. And by the 1940s, they had created an antibiotic from the same type of mold, an antibiotic they called penicillin. After this amazing drug, perhaps the medical discovery of the war. Penicillin saved countless allied lives during World War II and won Fleming a knighthood in 1944 and in 1945 a Nobel Prize. Sir Alexander Fleming died a popular hero in 1955. Through mass production methods, America is continually increasing its output of penicillin. And though millions have benefited from his discovery over the years, penicillin and other antibiotics are now losing much of their effectiveness in the face of growing bacterial resistance. All the more reason for today's medical researchers to watch out for peculiar developments in their petri dishes. Okay, so why did I start with this classical historical example? Well, because it really underlines the importance of communication, and specifically the importance of communicating about your research as a scientist. This, of course, is Alexander Fleming. You might know him. He's the man who discovered penicillin. In 1928, he, well, he wrote a paper uh, with his research findings, um, but he didn't really put a lot of effort into spreading the message or to get it into accessible media, mainstream media, so the news didn't really catch on. And it's only in 1938, so 10 years later, that a number of scientists stumble across the paper. It's 1938, so we know that World War II was just around the corner, and there are a lot of wounded soldiers who could have used penicillin, but it wasn't ready. Um, unfortunately, the production only starts running well by 1944. Luckily, by then, there was enough penicillin available for each wounded soldier, which is amazing, of course, um, but that's only by the end of war. 
So you see how much impact that communicating, or in this case, not communicating can have. Um, Fleming did a wonderful discovery and ever since the antibiotic was available on the market, it's estimated that about 100 million lives or more have been saved. So yes, that is pretty impressive, of course, but, and that's the million dollar question, what if this man, Mr. Fleming, had communicated better and earlier? How high would the number have been then? Now, of course, let's be honest, not every research leads to a world altering medicine, but it's a clear example. And on the next slide, you can see a quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson. You might know him or not. Um, this is just another illustration of why science communication matters, why it's important. So let's take a minute to let the quote sink in. To be scientifically literate is to empower yourself to know when someone else is full of bullshit. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful to help rid the world of some of that bullshit? And you may or may not realize it, but you as researchers, as scientists, you are the perfect ambassadors to actually reach out to the public, to empower people in their knowledge, and essentially, you know, make the world a little more scientifically literate. Now, I promised that I would introduce myself. Um, we're here. My name is Sarah. I work for the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. In short, that's the VUB, and you can see the logo of my university in the bottom left corner. Um, and I work there for the Science Outreach Office. Now, if you haven't heard of the term science outreach, um, there's a lot of overlap between science outreach and science communication. Um, but outreach puts a little more emphasis on actually reaching out to the general public, so layman audience, non-scientists, and so on. And if you would ask me to explain what we do in one sentence, then I would say we spread science and we spread the love for, for science. And how do we do this? By building a bridge between you and the world out there. So between scientists, university and society. And our main goal is to inform, to engage, to inspire the public um, and also to increase your impact on society. And our university has been doing this for a long time. You see it on the slide, it's since 1984. That's even before I was born. So let's say we've been uh, kindly nudging scientists into public engagement and science communication for a while. Now this quote here is something that we regularly hear. As a scientist, you might be thinking, yeah, I know Sarah, that sounds great, but you know what I do, it's really complicated. And even my own mom doesn't understand what I do. My boyfriend doesn't have a clue. So there's actually no point in trying to explain it because it's way too difficult. Um, of course, that's where we come in. Uh, we want to break that taboo. And as a science outreach office, we offer very specific projects. So existing formats like a science festival, a children's university, and so on. And I'll talk you through some of our projects later on. But those are formats that our researchers can simply join. That means that they don't have to start from scratch. And me and my colleagues are there to help them along the way. It also means that when they sign up for a certain project, they always get training and support. And we firmly believe that certainly taking your first steps uh, into science outreach well, it should not be a lonely experience. Um, and you know, why trying to reinvent the wheel if there's a support system available? Why does it matter? Why would you do science outreach? Well, first of all, you'll get to interact with society. You'll have a direct impact on the world and also the minds around you. And that can be a very powerful and also a rewarding thing to do. We also notice that once people have found us, uh, they're likely to come back. So that must mean something. And secondly, you'll gain impressive skills, uh, learning how to communicate, how to communicate research, how to get a message across. That's a useful skill to have 
first of all, as a researcher, for sure, but also in any other career path that you might want to follow outside of academia. Um, a lot of young scientists don't stay in academia and they branch out into private sector education and so on. And then this might be another trigger for some of you. Don't forget that funding bodies actually want you to do outreach. More and more, you know, impact on society, public engagement, and so on, they're becoming part of funding applications. It's quite a new phenomenon, but first at least, um, yeah, it's an important incentive. Now, if this would be the end of my pitch and I only had five minutes, I would say my call to action would be find your science outreach office. Um, it might be hiding behind another name. Um, we are, for example, part of the research department of our university, but it could also be um, a part of a communication office or even sometimes a marketing department, although in my humble opinion, that's something completely different. Um, but just, you know, support is probably available somewhere if you look for it in your institution. Okay, high time that I show you what it's all about. I'm going to give you some, ex some examples of the projects that we do. Not all of them, that's way too much. Um, but the first example is Bright Club. And Bright Club is essentially a stand-up comedy show. Only it's not by comedians, it's by researchers. And our researchers, if they sign up for this, they get a short but very intense stand-up comedy training. Um, three weeks to write a seven or eight minute sketch a general rehearsal, and then it's showtime. So it's an actual proper stand comedy show. That means they get on stage in a bar and they're joined by a professional comedian who warms up the crowd. Uh, it's always great fun. And if you're willing to go slightly outside of your comfort zone, um, that's the perfect project for you. And if I'm not mistaken, this is actually one of the few projects where we welcome researchers from other universities as well. Okay, now if you're not feeling that adventurous and you like your audience a bit younger, we also have other projects for our researchers. Another way for them to get involved is to join our children's university. And that's a project that is aimed at uh, 10 to 12 year olds. So we work with primary schools here in Brussels and our researchers first get a training with tips and tricks on how to work with kids and, and how to explain science on their level. And then they create a workshop around their own expertise. And then after a feedback session with us and their colleagues, their fellow workshop givers, they're ready to test it out on real life kids. And it's a wonderful way to inspire the next generation, to get them excited about science and present it as a part of their world and their future. Um, and maybe hopefully also a chance to work on the slightly dubious image that uh, science has these days. Now for um, some people, personal contact is not at all what they like to do. So if you like to stay behind your own computer, cozy and warm and not see another face, no problem, we have other options like blogging. We run a website that is called wittenschap.be. It sounds a bit strange, uh, but for those of you who don't speak Dutch, that's simply the Dutch word for science, but without the vowels. Um, we publish mainly in Dutch, but we, but we publish in English as well. Um, by now we have more than 70,000 users a year and some of our blogs also appear elsewhere. So for example, uh, on the website of EOS, we have a collaboration with them and they are a well-known popular science magazine here in Belgium. Now, again, if you blog for us, um, you are not on your own. Um, you send us the first draft, then you'll be coached personally by our editor team. And during that process, you discover, you know, what's appealing about your research and you learn how to get your message across in an accessible way. Now, up until now, I have been talking about how to get your research and your expertise to the general public. Another way to get in touch with the world out there is to turn it around and to actually tailor your research or tailor your educational efforts in university to society and what society needs. And that is actually what happens in, for example, 
wetenschapswinkel. Now, literally translated, um, this project is called Science Shop. Um, and it's a very interesting project for researchers who are supervising students during a bachelor thesis or a master thesis. So students who are doing research. And what we do is we work together with civil society organizations and nonprofit organizations here in Brussels and beyond. And we are collecting hundreds of possible research topics. So real questions and real needs in our communities that could be answered in a thesis or another research project with students. And there's an extensive database on the website um, and SignShop helps researchers, for example, to get in touch with organizations and their academic domain, et cetera. University or university um, is a similar example. And in short, there we support professors and lecturers to make their research and education community-based or community-engaged, as we call it. So in collaboration with citizens, with civil societies, uh, civil organizations, and so on. OK, so this was to give you an idea of what is out there. And I'm not going to go into detail about how exactly you communicate about your research. Um, that's a whole different ballgame and not the focus of my talk. But this is just one simple slide that addresses three main concerns that we run into. So things that we feel or hear that hold people back. Um, the main message is already there. Uh, yes, you can do this too. First of all, you have something to offer even if you've just started out. So you don't need a mind boggling discovery uh, to do science outreach. Um, you already have knowledge and you've gained a specific way of looking and structuring the world as a scientist. And that's interesting, that's valuable on its own. Um, we see also, for example, in the children's university that just being there in front of them is valuable. If they see a person that is not um, old and white and a man uh, wearing glasses, uh, maybe having a beard, uh, wearing a white coat in a lab, you get a picture, um, then you're already, you know, uh, changing the way that those kids look at science and scientists. And maybe because of that, becoming a scientist themselves doesn't seem so far-fetched anymore because you actually look like them. A second thing that I wanted to get across is that you don't always have to dumb down your research. Um, the key is always to find simple words to explain maybe a difficult concept. Um, I'm not saying that you don't have to try to make it a little bit easier to understand or that everyone is Einstein, not at all, but just know that people and even kids can understand a lot. If you just translate it into normal words and you find a connection, their life, to their environment, uh, something that they know. And last but not least, you don't have to do this on your own. Of course, in the end, uh, you're the one who's doing it. Uh, we cannot do it for you, but just know that there are many tools available. That's almost it. Uh, this is already the very last slide. Um, I hope this has given you some inspiration and an idea of the kind of projects that are out there in the universe. Um, know that it's not always a lecture and not always a one-way street. The best projects aren't. Um, I also hope that your institution or university has a similar office or service um, with, of course, an equally motivated outreach team. For sure, I know in Belgium that's the case. Um, also good to know is that a lot of universities not only have their own projects, but also partner up with each other and also with other organizations. Um, we at the VUB, for example, are a go-between for a pint of science, who are also uh, speaking here today. So if you're interested in doing outreach, I warmly, warmly suggest looking up the support that's, that's already there. And, you know, if nothing else, you'll meet like-minded people, you'll get in contact with colleagues who want to get out there as well. So it's not only interesting and a learning experience where you gain skills, but it can be great fun and it can get you a useful network as well. Um, thank you for being with me. And yeah, if there are any questions about science outreach uh, at the university and how that can work, um, 
I'll be very happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Thank um, you, sir. Yeah, thanks for spending time on this and introducing us to all of these interesting ways. And I, like you said, there will also be a bunch of talks later that go a bit more in depth in those interesting ways and in how people can communicate their science. Sorry, Remy, I'm talking over you. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's uh, that's going to be the two of us juggling, figure out how, how we are <laughs> doing this co-hosting thing. Uh, I'm sure we'll 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 find a way to make it work. Um, I realize we have what ten minutes ish before the break, so maybe if there are questions to Siko or Sarah, we can actually just have a bit of a, a round of questions now. Mm. Anyone, Sounds good. I think there were a few questions in the chat, but if people want to sort of um, um, just turn on their mic and just ask, ask the speakers directly. Otherwise, we can ask the questions for you if you prefer. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, I can already uh, ask a question. So thank you so much, Sarah, for, uh, for giving this lovely presentation. Uh, also to Seiko, it was, uh, it was very, very nice. Um, actually, I was uh, kind of tempted to uh, connect it to uh, a little bit. In that sense, I guess that um, uh, as I feel is that uh, well, the, the, the thing that I got away from Seiko's uh, talk is actually that we indeed should involve someone in our research and not merely like passively communicating it, but just also like getting them fully engaged in the whole process that uh, everybody is indeed uh, far, far more uh, up to date with how science actually works. Um, and I think that's also what I found in, in, in Sarah's talk. Um, for example, also just the, the very small quote that you gave, like simple words and, and, and simple content actually does relate to that a little bit. I think we shouldn't make too much of a distinction between, between scientists indeed and, and, and the population, but merely really trying to uh, find a minimalistic way to bridge the gap and not also trying not to overdo it. Um, perhaps that's something to consider. Well, I don't. I hope I made myself clear by by saying that. Perhaps it's a little bit vague, but uh, it's also really something that I would love to uh, address in the in the panel discussion. Um, yeah, maybe. for sure. Um, I don't know if you had a, an actual question, no, no, um, but yeah. it's yeah, it's an interesting way to look at communicating. Um, also, what is nice about doing a project and can be anything is that. You have more time if you are in front of a, of a group of people in a bar and you're, you're doing a science bar where you have an hour or more to, to really interact with them. Um, and that's, that's different there. You can also go into the process of what science is and not just present the results, as Siko was saying as well. Um, there's nothing wrong with presenting results, but it's, it's good that we have these other kind of, kinds of interaction with the public as well. And uh, yeah, certainly for me, it's important to, um, to not only talk about these artifacts, but also getting people to understand what the process of science can be like. Um, also for young kids, if they can experience it themselves, I think that's, that's super valuable. Yeah. yeah, if I can add to that. Um... So the, 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 four, the four horsemen I showed uh, during my presentation, um, what I think is also problematic about this is that, for example, uh, one of them says free will doesn't exist. And these people get onto talk shows in the Netherlands and then uh, Matthijs van Nieuwkerk interviews him. It's like, oh, wow, that's wonderful, professor. Tell me more about how free will doesn't exist. But the thing that is rarely ever talks about is what makes you say this? What kind of experiment did you do? What kind of assumption did you have? And what kind of scanner did you push people in order for you to be able to, to, to say out loud for one and a half million viewers that the free will doesn't exist or that people who are uh, voting for right-wing parties have a smaller amygdala and that, make, that means that they're more, uh, or have a bigger amygdala and makes them more fearful. It, you never get an actual conversation on this topic because the people who are, in this case, this is a talk show example, are themselves not experts. But that thing, if you do this, also invo involve other people at the same table who do have an expertise and will say, Victor, you're talking bullcrap. <laughs> 
and th this is this is really because it has to stay funny or it has to stay happy or it has to stay popular uh, but in in the end i think this has real consequences for society if if these kind of messages are out there and maybe an example and then i'll shut up but um in the past i think decades uh, there's a beautiful book by angela saini who is a, a science journalist and a, an engineer by trade and uh, she also shows that for example the fact that we keep publishing research, uh, research with, uh, with results on sex really creates this image that the human sexes are very, very different from each other, even though the effect sizes of each of one of these studies is super, super small, and the effects in the reverse order or the non-existent effects are never, never actually published or actually spoken or communicated about, which creates a sense and an image in society which has real world consequences. And in this case, I, I often miss that when that you have this moment when a researcher seeks the stage, that there, there is no nobody talking back to them. And this is not, I don't think this is communication. This is just sending information. It's more like an, uh, like it's, it, it's, it's, an hagebrek. It, it's, it's not a discussion. Yeah. I think yes. Stefan, you want to ask uh, Simon's question? Yes, we had a we had a question in the chat. So the, the question is for Zara. Um, if if you keep track of like using data, some form of matrix or data measures of how effective the different forms of communication um, are um, and in terms of engaging more people. And I, I think there are some examples like different types of events that you organize or different types of support for PhD students. How do you keep track of them and how effective are they being measured? Yeah, it's an interesting question because what I see there is you have effectiveness and how much people you reach. And actually, for me, those two are different things. Um, you can have a talk that's a, a, a one way mean the means of communication uh, and you can reach maybe thousands of people if you put it online um, but for me that's not less meaningful than for example having a group of kids where you really have an impact um, so but do we measure it um, we we try to but actually i think there's a lot more to gain from actually research on science communication um, science communication in itself is pretty young I think. Um, so research on science communication is, is even younger. Um, I think it's starting up now. Um, and there's more and more, you know, funding and money available to do those things. Um, but yeah, there's there's much to learn still, I think. And we should continue to to measure it and, and see, you know, what it does. But it's difficult. Sometimes it's easy. If you just want to know how many people were at our science festival, of course, I can give you numbers. But if you want to measure, and I'm sorry, I'm talking about kids a lot, but I'm, uh, I'm coordinating the children's university. It's really difficult to measure what the impact is, because maybe if they do this when they're 10 or 12 years old, maybe later on, because they were interested uh, at, the, at a younger age, they will choose to study something in science. But it's very, very hard to, to measure those things, of course, but good question. I like the evidence-based approach to uh, commit to SciComm. I like the I like that way of doing it. Uh, I think we'll take Doreen. You had a question, and I think after that we'll go into the break. Yeah, I think my question relates a lot to Simon. So I think um, there were also a few other points made in the chat which should deserve some more attention. <laughs> I think. Rob, you what uh, points are you referring to, Doreen? Uh, Ashis, for example, and um, Monica. Monica, I'm not sure. I think, yeah, Ashish um, had the point about uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, saying that, you know, that some experts might have a very, might have some experts in their given field, but they might be completely non experts in other fields and then might just tend to just overreach a little bit and then. Um, Assuming that they are, uh, wait, I think the phrasing for machines was way better. <laughs> I'm getting lost into my own uh, thoughts there. Even scientists who are experts in their own fields, maybe, not always, scientifically, could be scientifically illiterate to tackle a problem in another field. Many experts in non relevant fields were responsible in spreading mistruths regarding COVID. I think that's fair, uh, a fair comment, especially with regards to the 
the the quote like Neil deGrasse Tyson also overreaching <laughs> a lot in terms of what to what to name as something that is bullshit or not. Yeah, for sure. But it's I difficult, agree. right? It's difficult yeah. to know if you're looking at a popular science communicator um, to figure out, should I be thinking this is bullshit or is it actually not? And like, what should I be doing as uh, someone who is not necessarily knowledgeable on the topic that the communicator is speaking about? about what should I be doing to, mm. to kind of fact check them? Or do I even know that I should be fact checking them? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess um, this is also something where the media has a lot of responsibility. Um, you know, for us, it's it's kind of easy because we have this this pool of amazing researchers and at our university, and we we know what they're doing and what their background is, and yeah, we have some some control, and we have responsibility to not put people on a stage that shouldn't be there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a huge problem if you just go on the internet or YouTube and you say, yes, I'm a researcher, so I know everything about everything. Of course, that's that's very problematic. And I agree also that we see this more and more. Um, so yeah, you, you can't fix that um, just as, as one person or as one institution. Uh, the only thing that, that we can do is be careful uh, on what we put out, I think, yeah. I think perhaps to round off, there's a good comment in the chat um, saying that's why it's important to have multiple people on when you when you do a talk like that or we interview someone like people bringing diverse sets of backgrounds, experience and opinions. Yeah. Well, thank you. So I think we should go into the break in about 12 minutes. We're carrying on. Um, so take a quick uh, break, grab some coffee, uh, whatever you like, and then we'll uh, see you again shortly.